Welcome to the Expat Empire Podcast, the podcast where you can hear from expats around the world and learn how you can join them. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for the fifth episode of the Expat Empire Podcast. Today, we will be hearing from Misha Yurchenko. Misha was born in the Ukraine, grew up in the United States, and has lived in Tokyo since graduating from university. We discuss many topics, including what it is like to work as a recruiter in Japan, how to avoid common job seeker pitfalls when looking for a position in Japan, tips for getting a good deal in an apartment in Tokyo, how to sponsor your own visa by creating a company in Japan, and much more. Without further ado, let's start the conversation. Hey, Misha, thanks so much for joining the Expat Empire podcast today. Yeah, man, uh, really uh, glad to be on and um, hope I can uh, be of help somehow and uh, share my my funky stories with uh, people listening. Yeah, definitely. Excited to hear them. So if you could tell us first a little bit about where you're originally from and where around the world you've lived so far and where you're currently at right now. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll try and give you a, kind of a short version. So, um, so I've been in Tokyo now for about five years. And um, originally, I was actually born in the Ukraine, but had moved uh, to the U.S. when I was around three. And I grew up, yeah, mo- most of the time I was in Arizona, southern Arizona. And then I went to school um, in Texas throughout middle school and high school, and then went to the University of Austin, Texas. Uh, and, and then I went to Jochi University, which is uh, Sophia University, for those who are not familiar, and uh, did that for a year as a study abroad exchange in Japan, um, went back to the U.S., graduated, and then moved directly to Tokyo upon uh, graduation. And I've been here uh, ever since. So what was it about maybe that study abroad experience that really piqued your interest in working abroad and working in Japan in particular? I think we could uh, probably go back a few years before that. So I was actually um, m- m- missed, a, missed a small part there. So I was actually living in France for for about two years when I was when I was around 12 or 13 years old and uh, my mom was actually studying over there. So we were just there for a bit. And um, it was kind of really random because Japan hadn't been on my radar um, at all at that point. It was just, uh, yeah, I mean, just knew about Japan like everyone else did. Uh, didn't really read manga or, or anime or anything. And I, um, I was taking French classes, which were required. And then at, at some point, um, the French school I was attending needed me to, or required a second language other than French. So my options were uh, Italian, German, and Japanese. And um, those classes were all taught in French, which was a language I didn't speak. So it was this kind of weird situation where I was like, okay, it doesn't really matter what language I take. Um, So I just kind of took Japanese on a whim because I thought it'd be fun and challenging. Uh, Maybe it was kind of an active rebelliousness as well just like hey you know, i'll probably fail this class anyways and then and then um i ended up taking it and just kind of fell in love with the language and there's actually uh, you know really you know really cool japanese teacher and uh i made some japanese friends at the time so i guess probably from from that age of 13 i just had this really positive impression of of japan and um i you know studied the language a little bit uh, not too seriously and then i think maybe it was let's say I think maybe two or three years after that, I, I said, hey, what, why don't I just go check out Japan? It's kind of a, seems like a cool place and I speak the language. So that was um, when I decided to do a three week study abroad program, uh, sorry, a homestay program, uh, you know, staying with a Japanese family in Fukuoka. So I went over there for, for a few weeks and just fell in love with it, man. It was like, you know, the first time you go to Japan, it's, you've got that kind of gaijin um, experience where everyone's staring at you and, uh, you know, wants to talk to you and you go out and I think I was, you know, I was 16 at the time, but I was still able to get into bars and, and, and drink, which was very bizarre, but a lot of fun. Like, imagine, imagine as a 16 year old, it's like, holy shit, like, uh, this is, this is awesome. So I think um, uh, that was, yeah, a lot of fun at the time. And then when, when I got back, um, back to the U.S. after that program, it was, yeah, it was just kind of like, you know, the, the ball was rolling from there and I was like, why don't I just continue studying? And one thing led to the next and I, um, I, I got a bit more serious about studying in university. And then that's when I decided to go to Tokyo for the one year study abroad program. 
Nice. And uh, is that actually what you majored in at university? Were you majoring in Japanese or uh, did you combine it with something else as well? Yeah. So I was, I actually started out as a business major, but I'm just awful with numbers. So I think I switched after a few months and then um, I transferred to international relations, which is just like a very broad, like liberal arts degree, uh, you know, studied politics, economics and uh, culture. And then I actually minored in East Asian studies with a focus on Japan. Um, so that just, that was just a lot more language classes and culture, like Japanese culture. And did you have a particular plan for after graduation? I guess your main goal was to get to Japan, but did you know exactly how that would come about? Or did you have any, you know, particular ideas to what career you would have in Japan? Yeah. So I think like most people, uh, kind of exploring this question and, you know, people that are just, you know, want to get to Japan, um, you know, they oftentimes, uh, I think it was, I think it was actually at a career fair, but, um, I think oftentimes people will just think of English teaching as, as the obvious kind of choice to, to, to get started and to go, to go to Japan in that route. Um, and so that was obviously something I'd heard about and, uh, started exploring, but I didn't actually have a specific goal or plan or a uh, career plan. I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but it was just like this, this one goal, like, Hey, I have to get to Japan somehow. Um, so I went to, um, I went to the Boston career forum, uh, the year before I graduated, because that's, that's kind of, uh, from, from what I heard at the time was, is a great place to meet companies. And um, even if I couldn't find a job there, j just at least a network. So I went out there, uh, for a few days to, to look for a job. And really at that point, I honestly, then I had no idea what, um, what other jobs are out there really. Um, other than English teaching. And I, I just went up to companies, just random companies, went up to their booths and just started talking to them um, and, and interviewing. Uh, so I interviewed with a, with a few companies, uh, you know, some, some health tech company. I interviewed with a couple of recruitment companies there. I had no idea what recruitment was at the time. And uh, I totally, totally bombed, I think, all of those interviews. Um, and uh, actually, I actually was a day late because my flight was delayed. So I think it just kind of screwed everything up. So it, for me, it, it wasn't the most positive experience, but I did come out of there uh, with a bit more knowledge of, okay, you know, there are these sorts of companies that are hiring and uh, it, it is possible to get to Japan, um, you know, th through Rakuten or, you know, various other, um, you know, co companies that aren't necessarily just like Akai or English teaching. So and is that one of the routes that you ended up pursuing, or how did you actually get that first job in Japan? Yeah, so, so out of um, it's kind of yeah, I just kind of remembered that because it's it's been um, it's been so many years. But I um, I I was at the career fair and I interviewed with a company called Rakuten, which is a massive e-commerce player um, in in Japan, and uh, you know, basically the Amazon of Japan, and um, they had you know, uh, they had interviewed me a few times and I, I thought it went really well. And I got back to, um, you know, Texas a few days later and they, they, you know, given me a call and said, Hey, you know, we really enjoy the interviews and I would like to offer you. So there was like this verbal offer over the phone, um, from, from this company I'd met there. And, you know, I was, they didn't give me any details. They didn't tell me what position they just kind of made this verbal offer. So I was really excited and I was like, Hey guys, you know, I'm going to, uh, I got a verbal offer from this company and I was telling, telling everyone until my parents and then uh, basically it was just cricket. So it was just silence for two weeks. And uh, I kept, you know, I emailed them, I called them back and then um, I, I don't really know what happened there to be honest, but basically the HR apologized and said, look, um, actually, you know, we, uh, we have to return the offer and we're not, um, we're not going to be able to offer you at this time. So that was kind of a really weird experience. Like my first weird experience with Japanese HR um, of which I had many afterwards. But, <laughs> yeah, um, I'm gonna guess that you have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was just like, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know what happened there. It's probably just some some uh, hiccup or, 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 or mess up on their end. But um, I uh, yeah, I was I was a little bit disappointed after that, as as you can imagine. So I was kind of scrambling. Like you know, I think it was uh, February or March at the time, just a few months before I was about to graduate that summer. So I was kind of freaking out. I was like, you know, what am I gonna do? Um, I, I, I thought I had this job, and so at that point, I put in my application for the JET program, which is 
the um, an English teaching program here in Japan, which is like one of the best. Uh, it wasn't really my plan A, uh, but again, I just wanted to get to Japan. So I applied for that and I um, also started applying for recruitment companies. This is kind of where recruitment comes in to the mix because I had heard about uh, recruitment when I went to the Boston Career Forum and that piqued my interest. So I did a bit more research on it. I had a friend who was working at LinkedIn in the US and uh, she was also Japanese. So I was like, hey, um, Melanie, what, what, um, what recruitment companies would you recommend um, in terms of you know reputation and salary, all these things in Japan, like are there any good recruitment companies? So she sent me a list of 10 companies and I just applied to all of them. Um, and I just started interviewing, you know, for Robert Walters, Michael Page, Hayes, all these different, um, you know, mostly foreign recruitment companies. Uh, in parallel, I was also, you know, applying for the JET program. So basically I had these two different career paths that I was exploring at that time. And I really had no concept of what recruitment was. And even, you know, even when I first got to Japan and actually started working in recruitment later, I still didn't really understand what it was until a few months on the job. So it was, it was really like this black box. And I was like, you know, whatever, it sounds like a cool job. Um, it's sales and marketing and, um, you know, it seems very fast paced. So I was, I was really just, just trying to get here. And, and I think that that's maybe how a lot of people approach it. But, but anyway, so I had, um, gone through a round of interviews and I ended up getting accepted into the jet program and, I got accepted into a couple of recruitment companies as well. Uh, one of them, Wall and Case, which is where I ended up joining. Just really felt, um, can't really explain why I joined, but I think at the time I really liked all the people there and some of the companies that, uh, some of the clients that they were working with seemed really interesting. So I was like, hey, this seems like a good fit and um, ended up joining that company and then moving to Tokyo two months later. Nice. What was that moving process like? What all did you have to get ready, uh, get together? And, you know, I'm sure it was a bit of a scramble as it has been my case in the past. So, Yeah, man, it, it was like, I remember that week that I was getting the offer. I'd actually, um, my appendix almost burst and I had to go to the hospital. So, oh. <laughs> yeah, so, so I was, I was like, you know, I was on pain medicine. I was, I was freaking out. I was, you know, trying to get my visa together. Um, it was a bit of a mess, but uh, if I can, I mean, I, I don't think there was anything uh, too complicated about it. I mean, there, there was a certificate of eligibility I had to apply for. I had to go down to the embassy. Um, the company, you know, spo obviously sponsored my visa, which was uh, a five-year, uh, I think it was like specialties in humanity visa or something. And um, I mean, the, the process was really straightforward. I, I think the company had obviously brought in lots of foreigners uh, before, so that you know, the process was pretty streamlined, uh, which was, I think, yeah, I, I guess I was really lucky um, in that sense. And um, they also helped find an apartment for me the first month. Um, so I actually didn't didn't have to worry about that, at least for the first month. And I, when I got to Tokyo, I was living there um, in, in this kind of really, you know, uh, dodgy, like, service apartment. And then that, that first month, I was looking for my own apartment. Um, in uh, in central Tokyo, um, so I had to I had to find that, and that was that was a bit of a an experience because I remember oh, all, all the places I was looking at. I, I was sitting there with a real estate agent, and um, you know everyone he would call was just basically just saying no, we, we don't allow foreigners to stay in this apartment. So that was a bit of a shock for me. Um, and uh, but and, no, anyways, I ended up finding a place in Shibuya, which was which was really nice. I got lucky there. And um, I've actually been living there ever since. So, Do you have any particular advice for people looking to find apartments, maybe the nice areas or how to find those places that allow for foreigners to live there? Yeah, I mean, I think there's uh, one thing to note is all the real estate agencies in Japan share the same database. So um, I think ultimately everyone has access to the same uh, apartments. It's just a matter of finding a just a trustworthy and uh, you know, a good real estate agent that is willing to, yeah, be flexible and listen to you and understand, you know, what you're looking for. Uh, but at the end of the day, like, you know, they're going to have access to the, the same location. So just keep that in mind. But I, um, what, what, one thing I, I realized later on was that there are certain parts of the real estate um, 
or it's just the rent that are actually negotiable. And I think when you're first coming here, you know, you, you, you might not have so much confidence to do that, uh, especially if it's, you know, your first job and you just kind of want to find a place. But I, I, I would just suggest negotiating. And uh, there are a, are a lot of kind of hidden fees and just extra fees that, you know, you, you know, you, you get, you'll probably find out about, uh, like the Shikin and the Reikin. And it adds up to, you know, three, four, five months rent up front, which is, you know, pretty big down payment for a lot of people. And uh, I, fi- I found that if you, if you just ask, and I've, I've had other friends do this since, if you just ask for an apartment that doesn't have those down payments, then they will actually, uh, many of the times they'll find a place for you that, that is half that price, um, still, you know, in a good location. So sometimes it's just a matter of asking those simple questions. Um, and yeah, you might be surprised um, by what, by what you find. Sure. Yeah, that's great advice, actually, because it can be a significant amount of money up front. As you were looking at different apartments around central Tokyo, as you mentioned, you ended up in Shibuya. Uh, what's, you know, interesting about that area to you? What, what made it a good spot? Are there other areas that you'd consider living in if you were to move? At the time, I couldn't really afford the apartment I was, I was uh, living in. Um, mm-hmm. and, and the reason I chose that, uh, you know, Shibuya is a fairly um, expensive, you know, expensive area in general. It's, it's, it's very central, a lot of clubs, a lot of bars. Um, Google is actually building a new office here uh, just right next to the station. So it's, it's getting even, um, you know, bigger and a lot of, yeah, a lot of construction now. But, but anyways, I, I just wanted to be near my office was the main thing. Um, so it's about a 10, 15 minute walk from where I was working. And the second thing was just because it was in the center, um, particularly the center of nightlife, I just wanted to be part of that. I was I was like young and I just got here, so I thought it'd be a lot of fun, um, and, and it was. So, so I'm glad I made that choice. But I think the first six months I was really just scraping by. I think at one point I had to borrow money from my manager uh, because I just couldn't pay rent. I was like, hey, you know, I'm sorry, like I um, I'm paying all these bills, blah blah blah. And so he was, you know, f- fortunately he was really nice. And then um, that was the last time I ever asked anyone for money. <laughs> but um, uh, right. after that, after I made my first bonus on the job, um, you know, paying the rent wasn't wasn't a big deal anymore. But those first few months were, were definitely really tough. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily recommend this area. It should be for everyone. Um, it, is, it can be quite loud. It can be quite crowded, even more so now. With just you have a lot more people moving here. Um, so yeah, I, I would say if. If you live 30 or 40 minutes west um, of Tokyo, uh, for example, out towards um, on the Chuo line, the, the red line, um, out towards like um, Kokobunji or Musashi Kogane, um, uh, Higashi Kogane, uh, those are actually really nice, quiet areas. And you can commute to the center of Tokyo within 30, 40 minutes max. So you'll, you'll find that the, that the rent prices are way, way cheaper. And... Um, I would say per, my personal opinion is like as long as it's not more than like 45 minutes or so, it, it, it's not it's not so bad uh, because the trains are obviously quite efficient. But if you're commuting for more than a couple hours a day, then that's just it can be a bit depressing. How did you find living and working in Japan compared to when you were living there as a student? So f- fortunately, I had studied here for a year, as I mentioned, and uh, while my my Japanese was definitely uh, not fluent, but, you know. I would, I would just describe it as conversational. Uh, the culture, you know, the cultural part of, of just being here w- wasn't really a shock to me. Uh, I'd actually had a bank account already and uh, I had a couple of friends here from school. So it wasn't like I was just coming in for the first time. And I think that made it a lot easier uh, just, just because I tested the waters. And I, I would really recommend mm-hmm. that to anyone, not, not just to move here out of the blue without having spent at least a few weeks or months here uh, because it is a big shift. So. I think when I joined, I was really able to just kind of hit the ground running and, uh, you know, just do the job. So my, my, my first few weeks, uh, my first few months really uh, were, were kind of a haze. And I was, I, was, <laughs> I was staying in the office, you know, very late, just trying to understand how the industry worked and uh, doing all the nomikais, you know, just going out drinking with colleagues, uh, getting to know everyone. I mean, it was a very intense kind of initiation process, I guess you could call it. So now that you've seen the other side, do you have any advice for people uh, looking to work as an English language recruiter in Japan? Uh, what's the best route to actually getting that job and what's the interview process like? For sure. So there are literally 
thousands of recruitment companies in Japan. Uh, I think in Tokyo alone, there are over 3,000 registered recruitment agencies. Uh, so not all of those, of course, are, are large. I mean, some of those are just one-man shows, and they just have maybe a, a few employees. But uh, my, my point is there are a lot of options, and I think it, it's, definitely, um, it's definitely wise to kind of come in and assess the, the different types of recruitment firms, um, the, uh, the different industries they're working in. For, for example, you could join a company, um, let's say, let's take one recruitment company, for example, like N-World, and, um, you know, get put into their uh, team that focuses on automotive clients. And you are dealing with, you know, very traditional domestic suit and tie type salarymen um, and, and, and business people. And that that is a very different world than going in and joining a recruitment company that works with startups, where everyone's international and speaks English. So <clears throat> I think it's, yeah, I guess the first point is just just to really make sure you know what team you're going to be in. Make sure you are interested in that industry because you you know you will become deeply deeply familiar with that and spend most of your time kind of studying and meeting those sorts of people. Uh, and I guess the second thing is just maybe this applies to a lot of companies, but your manager, your direct boss, uh, plays a huge huge role in how um, you develop and you know your success in the company because I think they're the person that's going to be there to, to you know, teach you the ropes and um, give you feedback. And if you don't have someone, especially in um, you know, a high pressured sales environment, if you don't have someone there to support you, it can be really, really tough and you know, you can burn out quite quickly. So I, I had a few times, I think the first, first year or so where I, I, I got pretty close to burning out, just, just working late basically, right. Just not knowing how to separate, you know, work and life and, I had my computer, so they gave us they gave us a MacBook, and you know we could just work from home, and that that was that was great. But then I didn't really know how to turn it off, so fortunately I had a really good manager who was like, you know, basically forced me to take a vacation. It's not just about the team, it's not just about the company or the industry, but it's really who are you working with every day? Who is going to be supporting you? And if you don't, um, if you don't really get along with that person, if if you're not inspired by them, then um, you know I, I would I would really you know look look at other options and and you know, weigh all those options out because it is going to make, uh, I think, a big difference. To take a step back, just if you could explain your own words, what the what your job was in recruiting and, and what it entailed day to day, and also maybe what kind of people you think best fit into that environment, that would be great. When I started recruitment, it was really, uh, really a black box. And I, um, I remember getting, getting to work on the first day and, you know, I had a few days of training. One of the training modules was was to uh, headhunt people or, or essentially call people that I didn't know. Um, and, um, uh, you know, I got a phone book and some phone numbers <laughs> and uh, my instructions were, you know, start dialing. And uh, I had really no idea what to do. It was, it was, it was, it was you know, kind of beyond me. So uh, basically what recruitment is, is in, in a nutshell, is you're helping, um, you're helping companies, let's say Amazon, for example. Um, you're, you're, you're helping a company like Amazon find talent, find employees, um, to fill certain positions. So if Amazon's looking for a marketing manager, then you know my job would be go, to go out and to, uh, to go on LinkedIn, to go through our uh, database that we've built and to locate someone that has the skills that Amazon's looking for and then essentially convince them um, to apply for the job and then help them through the interview process, negotiate their salary, negotiate their offer and uh, you know, place them, essentially you can call it placing place them into the company um, mm -hmm. and we're being paid by the client in this case uh, as Amazon um, and they're paying you a, uh, a fee that's usually equivalent to um, anywhere from three to six months of that person's yearly salary so that that's that's the basic business model and there's there's several different variations of um, you know recruitments you know there's permanent positions there's contract positions um, there's um, yeah, the, 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 there's a few different kinds, but essentially that the model is, is quite similar. And my day to day was pretty much different every day. So uh, the, the, the great thing was I was able to, uh, after some time, I was able to kind of make my own schedule where I knew that, you know, on any given day, I had to um, basically do two things. The, the first thing was I had to go find people that were qualified for uh, a job. So let's let's take the Amazon example again. So I have to go and meet a bunch of people um, that um, are potentially good candidates and might be interested in what I have to say. And that would 
you know, that would require me going out uh, all the way across town to have a coffee with someone or have a dinner. Uh, that might be a phone call. Uh, it, you know, it, it really just depended on, on the situation. And then the other part of the draw would be going out to meet new clients um, or existing clients. And so there's really just the two sides, the candidate, the candidate side and the client side. Um, so you're, you're, you're constantly kind of managing and juggling uh, both, both sides, um, always communicating with people, always managing expectations um, in, in the sense that, you know, you don't really know, you don't really know when someone's going to change your mind. So, you know, if you have, uh, let's say, Tanaka-san, uh, you're helping Tanaka-san interview for a position at Amazon, uh, you know, you, maybe maybe tomorrow he decides he doesn't like Amazon anymore. Maybe maybe his wife comes back and says she doesn't want him to work for a foreign company. You know, you, you, you have to kind of expect and manage all these different situations. And then you also have to manage it from the client's perspective and explain to them <laughs> what's going on. So you're, you're juggling both of those. And then, of course, there's the internal situation of, you know, actually working at the company I was working at um, and meeting certain targets and KPIs, key performance indicators. Uh, for example, uh, you know, many people might not know this, but while the goal is to help people find jobs, uh, you know, we have certain targets that we have to meet on a weekly basis, like uh, the number of resumes that we send. So in any given week, I would have to send 15 resumes to my client. And uh, if I didn't, I would get negative feedback. Some companies are a lot more strict than others. Um, you know, some some will really base your bonus on those targets. If and if you don't meet them, it's just yeah, everyone can kind of see what what you're doing in the company. There's usually a dashboard or like a you know a blackboard or something where those uh, stats are written. Right. It's very emotional at times because you're essentially dealing with people's careers. Same time you're managing these internal targets, which which can be a bit of a contradiction in some ways because you're you're kind of assigning a metric to a person so there, there were times where it was it was certainly um yeah it was certainly stressful and uh personally i i chose to at times ignore <laughs> ignore those metrics and just kind of do my own thing and i think ultimately that worked for me uh because i i spent time getting to know people building a network and um, finding them good jobs that they actually wanted to do and uh, while I didn't necessarily meet every target on a weekly basis over the midterm and the long term, my results were very good. Yeah, maybe going back to another a question you had is just short term versus long term. How if you're if you're looking at a recruitment company, you know what are they actually measuring? What what, what is the what are the inputs and outputs that they're looking at? Um, that that's a great question to ask if you're interviewing for for a recruitment firm, um, just to know what you're being measured on. For people that are interested in this type of work, I mean, what do you think makes a, a great recruiter? Do you have any specific advice for people that are looking into this? And also maybe the required Japanese level. Just to answer this uh, second question first. So Japanese level really varies. I used Japanese uh, my first six months on the job. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, was, I was negotiating contracts and, 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 you know, meeting candidates and clients in Japanese. And that was really challenging because my Japanese is pretty bad. So <laughs> um, I am actually not sure why they let me do that. But um, and uh <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I realized at one point I was like, "Hey, you know, maybe if I use English, uh, I'll, I'll do a lot better." And I, uh, yeah, I basically just you know made that decision at that point. Um, I could I could do 10x better, 10x faster if I was using my native tongue. And um, you know, for some people that really want to improve their Japanese and stick with it, you know, they may not make that choice. They may prefer to use Japanese. And honestly, I think that's that's a choice that you make because. Most companies that you deal with here in, in Japan, they're going to speak Japanese. Like there are very few clients that you'll meet who who don't speak any Japanese at all. Like there will be an HR person or there will be someone that speaks Japanese. So you will have that choice. Um, but it's very easy to just to default into English if if you know everyone speaks English. So so if your if your goal is really to maintain um, and improve your Japanese, then you know, working with purely foreign clients um, or a foreign recruitment firm that deals with foreign clients, um, you know, that, that can be uh, setting yourself up a little bit there, right? Because it, it'll be easy just to default into your, into your language. So just keep that in mind, I guess. And um, there, there are also, you know, there are lots of companies where, you know, they don't speak any English at all. And, and uh, um, that can also be tough in its own right. There, there are people that will do really well in one recruitment firm 
but fail miserably in another recruitment firm. So, so I think it's important to, to keep in mind that, that, yeah, like you may be a really good recruiter. You, you might have the, um, the sales ability or, uh, you know, just the passion and the drive to, to do well in like, let's say a really small recruitment firm where there's maybe 10 or 11 people, but you might struggle in a more corporate environment. So uh, I, I think that's, that's something to keep in mind. But, but in, in general, they say, I guess one of the, one of the <laughs> cliche sayings is like, um, recruitment is the business of rejection. And the reason they say that is because you're constantly either being rejected or you are rejecting someone. So let's let's say someone fails a job interview, you have to break the news and you have to tell them that, hey, you, you failed the interview for these reasons. And obviously people can be quite emotional. So you have to handle that as kind of a customer service. Uh, right. Or, or you're being rejected by someone like a client that says, hey, no, I don't want to work with you or uh, a candidate that says, hey, no, I don't, I don't want to apply for this job. So um, I, I would say just the resilience is, is most important. Like you don't have to be an extrovert by any means. Um, but I think just the ability to kind of bounce back and say, oh, okay, I understand. Like I was, I was rejected a hundred times today, but <laughs> that means I'm one step closer to getting a yes. And that's fine. Um, if you don't have that positive attitude, like you will get burned out very quickly and it's very easy to kind of get into a negative spiral in the job. So if folks are interested in maybe not working necessarily in recruiting or in English translating or English teaching from your perspective as a recruiter, what advice would you give to others looking to work in Japan? Uh, you know, what made some candidates the most successful that you've worked with and what are some common pitfalls that people can try to avoid as they try to get employment in Japan? Sure. Um, so I think a lot of that depends on, on the skills a person has, obviously, like if you, if you're a developer, um, you know, if, if, if you've got you know, strong mobile development skills, there are a lot of, uh, mobile ad agencies, a lot of development companies, a lot of, um, you know, in-house positions as well now that are, uh, I think available for foreigners with, uh, good, good dev skills, um, that don't necessarily need the language ability. So I think, uh, that's something to keep in mind is what, you know, what your expertise is and, um, is a language really required. But I think generally speaking, Japanese is, is still pretty important, um, for, for many jobs. And I, I wouldn't say that you have to be a fluent Japanese speaker, but, what I found is a lot of people will move move here with maybe a little bit of Japanese. Maybe they've studied a bit. Maybe they've been here for a few weeks. Um, they, they do some Skype interviews. They get a job, and then they um, they're just quite surprised by by uh, what they were told in the interview versus what the actual company is like. Uh, I have a good friend who worked at a actually um, a, a large cosmetics brand. Obviously, it's it's a, it's a foreign company, but it's actually very very traditional, very Japanese inside. Uh, because it's, they've been around for a while. So I think she was quite surprised when she got there with, with women in Japanese. Like all the meetings were in Japanese, and you know, the boss just expected her to speak Japanese, even though it was clear <laughs> before she got hired that it was quite limited. So <laughs> that was that was kind of unfortunate, but it, it happens a lot, you know? That's that's an unfortunate expectation set by the boss, which I assume was the person who also hired her. So that, that seems a little uh, little challenging. Yeah. So, so just, uh, <laughs> I, so just on that note, I mean, it's very important. Um, I think if I could give a, a little bit of advice is like, it's really important just to go actually, um, meet the company, meet the manager, spend a day at the office if you can. Um, you know, before you get hired though, like it's just, it's just absolutely necessary just to come to Tokyo or, or whatever city, um, you know, you're, you're planning on living in and, and just network and, just, and, and be here. Um, uh, cause I, I, I think being here versus getting a job overseas, uh, while you're overseas, it's just, it's just completely different. What would you say are some good skill sets for people to be able to bring to Japan and be successful here? First part is just just having uh, a little bit of sensitivity. Even in the example of the great developer, right? The great developer that comes to Tokyo um, and gets hired at you know at um, some, some some mobile app company or something, or even even Facebook or Google, like whatever. Uh, they're not necessarily going to do well in a Japanese setting because. Uh, maybe back in the U S if you're the loudest person in the room, then you know, you kind of get heard. But if you're the loudest person in the room in Japan, then that that's, that's seen as a bit crass and um, not very humble. So I think ju just in any industry you're in, in any career and just kind of being cautious of um, yeah, kind of what um, cultural norms that you have and, and just kind of making sure that um, you, you adapt a little bit. I would say industries to potentially look at now, um, in the tech space, which is what I'm most familiar with, 
Uh, there are obviously a lot of verticals there. Uh, a lot of travel companies, uh, which maybe is an obvious one, just because of the, you know you have the Olympics coming up and everything, and the government's putting in quite a lot of effort. Uh, there's so much going on. You know, anything in and around travel tech. Um, you know, Expedia. Uh, there's a company called Veltra, which is like a Japanese uh, travel site. Uh, you have a lot of media travel media sites. Um, like um, there's like All About Japan. Uh, there's uh, you know, discount sites like Tokyo Cheapo. I mean, there, there's a lot of, of basically foreign travel business, inbound business related companies. And I think if you look in that area, you can find jobs in sales, marketing, tech. Um, and it's a really uh, exciting area right now. So Cool. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice. And just getting back to your career a bit. So you, you kind of mentioned how the first months and maybe even first year went and, you know, there were a lot of challenges, but you were able to overcome those. How did your career progress from that point? And, you know, how does that bring you to maybe where you are today? So when I was, um, when I was working in the recruitment firm, I, I was there for four years. I, I quit about a year ago. So I've been in Japan uh, five years now. Mm-hmm. And uh, the reason I decided to quit was because I essentially had, had achieved the goals that I had set out to meet. Um, and that was, uh, that was around maybe year three, three and a half. Oh, you know, some of my, my big goals were one is to gain management experience. Two was to, um, you know, build a network in, in Japan. And three was to save some money. And when I felt I had done those things, um, even though, you know, I really enjoy the company, I still am friends with the CEO and a lot of people there. Uh, I just felt like it was, it was time to move on. So I, um, put in my good good three months notice um and and then after that i've i just decided you know stay in japan and um i um i was essentially procrastinating and (laughs) and traveling and writing and reading and um just kind of enjoying life after a full-time corporate job so now that you've left your job how have you actually managed to make your visa situation work i applied for a permanent residency in japan and um that was that was several months ago. So that essentially just means that I don't have to worry about a visa, right? And th- there's not many, uh, too many other benefits, <laughs> actually. Um, um, but but that was the main one. And I applied for that maybe you know, six, seven months ago. And uh, I spoke with uh, my lawyer who was helping me, and uh, you know we we called the immigration office, and basically she said that there's there's so many there are so many people applying for permanent residency that. It was like an eight, eight to nine month wait uh, for a response, which was wow. you know, pretty surprising. So I still haven't got a response. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah. Um, so in the meantime, you know, since my visa was expiring, I, um, I applied to sponsor my own visa. And the way I did that was um, I actually, sorry, it's a point that I forgot to mention, but during um, in, the, in, the, in the past year, year and a half, Actually, when I was still working at the recruitment company, I had started a company on the side. That side business came out of just a personal interest of uh, drones, drones in Japan. And I, 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 didn't, um, I didn't really see anyone, uh, any English-speaking website uh, that catered towards foreigners who are interested in kind of traveling with drones, flying drones, learning how to fly drones. So I basically just made this website um, catered toward, towards that segment. And it's very niche, but um, you know there are people who who like to fly drones. And <laughs> um, sure. so I was able to, to reach them and kind of um, provided a kind of a, a video service and rented drones as well. So anyways, that was officially a company I'd, I'd set up as a Godo Gaisha or a GK, um, which is basically like a limited liability corporation, LLC. Um, and the uh, upfront capital for that is actually compared to a, a, a Kabush Gaisha, which is a lot more expensive and you can basically put down like a hundred yen um for the upfront capital and uh you you can still register the company so uh the biggest saver lifesaver for me was just um or time saver i should say was finding a capable lawyer that could just kind of handle everything for me Mm -hmm. um and uh that that's just been yeah uh that this is really great to have someone that can also just give me advice on immigration and on on starting the company and all that and not that expensive um if you think about how much time it would take for me to do it myself absolutely <laughs> um so any, anyway so she helped me set up the company it cost like a thousand dollars for her time to do that um i had to make a stamp 
and that was like the main thing. I had to make a stamp for the company, and uh, that cost like twenty bucks. And then it's like a big old stamp. I don't know why they still use them, but um, <laughs> yeah. Is it difficult to have this company incorporated in Japan where you have to deal with so much physical paperwork as opposed to doing things online? It's definitely annoying. I mean, I get I get all sorts of papers in the mail that I uh, I still I still read them. Like there sometimes there are important things, but oftentimes you know Japanese banks and um, you know the government they just like send you garbage that you don't need. So or just like receipts or it's like okay I just throw them in the pile um, and then again like having an accountant having a lawyer just like makes things so much easier. So just I just give everything to them and I'm like hey guys like, here's the stuff um, help help me figure it out. Um, but um, but yeah, it wasn't that much of a pain to be honest. It's like the first month it was just I had to go to the bank, transfer some money, um, had to get the stamp, had to fill out some papers. All in all, it probably took me like two or three hours. Um, and then the lawyer did the rest of the work, and um, and then afterwards, you know, fast forward a year uh, to today, and uh, you know, I'm able to sponsor my own visa through that company that I'd set up. Um, and, and, the, and the basic requirements for that are, you know, you, um, you've just shown that you're actually making some sort of revenue. I think that's the main thing they look at. Um, you, don't necess- you don't have to be making a profit um, if the company is like under like, five years old or something like that. Um, Should everyone just try to take advantage of that opportunity? Because then you don't actually have to worry about getting someone to sponsor you. I mean, of course, it takes some amount of upfront capital. And if you're not making much money, or certainly if you're not making a profit, you know, that would be challenging if you don't have savings in place. But if it's really such a minimum amount of money that you have to put down up front and relatively low cost to actually get it started, you know, why, why aren't more people doing this? I, I don't think there's any big catch. I, uh, I, I, yeah, I know a few people that have done this, but I think the main thing is that if you've, especially if you've never been to Japan or you, you've only been here for maybe um, a few weeks or a few months, like the type of visa that you're going to get to sponsor yourself, it's probably only going to be like a one-year visa. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's just one thing to keep in mind. Like if you, if you want to sponsor yourself, start the company, sponsor yourself. Um, if, if you have no track record, track record in Japan, uh, if you haven't been here at all, then they might question that. I mean, it's very possible that um, they might go, okay, well, you know, what, what, what are you doing here? We're just going to give you a six-month visa or a one-year visa. Uh, but if you, you know, if you've come here already and, and you've had a job or you have uh, employees at your company or a Japanese co-founder is, is another good, good way to do it, uh, then you're more likely to get a one, two, or three-year visa uh, with that sponsorship. So I think maybe uh, not so many people are, are aware of that. Um, and they're not doing it or people that have moved here already kind of figured out after a while and then do that. Um, but I don't see too many people coming here right off the bat and, and taking that approach. So it's definitely possible. So I know that you've shared a lot of really fantastic advice for people that want to work and live in Japan, but I'm curious, do you have any other final pieces of advice? Well, I think that, um, something we didn't really talk about too much is I, I, I was, involved in uh, kind of the startup startup community here in, in Japan. Mm-hmm. And I think one of the biggest kept secrets uh, of Japan is like, it's a great place to, to have a startup. Um, once you get past you know, kind of the language and the cultural barriers, uh, I think there's there are actually more people and more companies here that support startups than there are startups. I think if, if anyone out there, uh, you know, don't just come to Japan and start a company without an idea. I think, you, you know, you have to have some understanding of, of what you're doing and, you know, solve an actual problem. But, uh, you know, Japan or Tokyo is never on the top 10 or 15 lists of, uh, you know, startup tech hubs. And uh, I think it should be. So, yeah, that, that would probably, probably be my last, uh, my last thing I'd like to say. Awesome. Is there any other way that our listeners can find out more about you and what you're doing and just keep, keep uh, up to date with your travels and fun stuff that you're up to in Japan? Yeah, sure. Um, so I write a lot on Quora, which is like a blogging site, Q-U-O-R-A. So you can just you know, type my name in and uh, find me there. Thanks to Misha for sharing his story with us. You can find the full transcript for this episode at expatempire.com. If you are interested in sharing your story on Expat Empire, please consider submitting a user post about your expat experiences on expatempire.com or email us at podcast at expatempire.com and let us know more about your international background. 
Music on this episode was produced by Eli Hermit. Please check him out on Bandcamp and Spotify. Keep up to date on new Expat Empire podcast episodes by pressing the subscribe button in the podcasting app of your choice. You can also visit expatempire.com and sign up for the newsletter to get notified about new podcast episodes and receive a ton of free expat and travel-related content. We're also on Facebook and Twitter, at Expat Empire, so be sure to follow us there. Last, but certainly not least, we would appreciate a five-star review on iTunes or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It helps new listeners to find us and lets us know that we are putting out content that you appreciate. Check back for our next episode in two weeks. See you then.